All right, so this was the definition we saw at the end last time. I tried to write it a bit larger. I just repeat the second of those definitions. This is the definition that connects the notion of evolutionary stability, for now in pure strategies, with Nash equilibrium. And basically it says this, to check whether a strategy is evolutionarily stable in pure strategies, first check whether S hat S hat is a symmetric Nash equilibrium. And if it is, if it's a strict Nash equilibrium, we're done. And if it's not strict, that means there's at least some other strategy that would tie with S hat against S hat. Then compare how S hat does against this mutation with how the mutation does against itself. And if S hat does better than the mutation, than the mutation does against itself, then we're OK. Right? And one virtue of this definition is it's very easy to check. All right, so let's, let's try an example to see that. And also to get us just back into gear and reminding ourselves what we're doing a bit. All right, so in this example, it's a sort of trivial game, but still, the game looks like this. All right, and we're asked, suppose we're asked the question, what is evolutionarily st uh, stable in this game? So no prizes for finding the symmetric Nash equilibrium in this game. Shout it out, what's the symmetric Nash equilibrium in this game? AA, okay, so AA, AA is a symmetric Nash equilibrium. That's easy to check. So really the only candidate for an evolutionarily stable strategy here is A, all right? So the second thing, the second thing you would check is, is AA a strict Nash equilibrium? So what does strict Nash equilibrium mean? It means that if you, if you uh, deviate, you do strictly worse. All right, so is AA strict Nash? Well, is it strict Nash or not? It's not, right? So if you deviate to B, you notice very quickly that UAA is equal to UBA. Is that right? It's just a tie. Right? Both of these get one. So it's not a strict Nash equilibrium. So we have to check our third rule. What's our third rule? So we need to check. We need to check how does A do against the possible deviation, which is here, which is B here. How does that compare with B against itself? All right, so U, A, B, the payoff to A against B is one. And the payoff to B against itself is Zero, one is indeed bigger than zero, so we're okay, and A is in fact uh, evolutionarily stable. All right, so just a very, very simple example to illustrate how quick it is to check this idea. All right, I want to spend all of today going over more interesting examples, so having the payoff for having invested in this last time. All right, and to start off with, get rid of this rather trivial example. Uh, I want to think about evolution as it's often applied in the social sciences. All right, so one thing you might talk about in the social sciences is the evolution of a social convention. All right, sometimes you'll read a lot in sociology or political science about the evolution of institutions or social conventions and things like this, maybe also in anthropology. And I want to see a trivial example of this just to see how this might work and see if we can learn anything. And the trivial example I'm going to think about is uh, driving on the left or the right, on the left or right side of the road. All right, so this is a very simple social convention. I think we all can agree this is a social convention. And let's have a look at the payoffs in this little game. So you could imagine people drive on the left or drive on the right, okay? And uh, if, you, uh, if you drive on the left and the other people are driving on the right, uh, you don't do great and nor do they. And if you drive on the right and they're driving on the left, you don't do great and nor do they, all right? And if you both drive on the right, you do fine. But if you both drive on the left, you do a little better because you look a little bit more sophisticated. 
All right. OK, so this is our little game. And we can see this, this, this could be an evolutionary game, right? So you could imagine this emerging, you, you, you could imagine a government coming in and imposing a law saying everyone has to drive on the left or everyone has to drive on the right. But you could also imagine at the beginning of, of, of roads uh, in different societies and different parts of the world, people just started doing something and then they settled down to one convention or another. And you can see how evolutionary stability is going to play a role here. Uh, well, uh, well, perhaps we should just w work it through and see what happens. All right, so what are, the, what are the potential evolutionarily stable things here? What are the potentially evolutionarily stable things? Let's, let's get, get some mics up. What's liable to be evolutionary, evolutionarily stable in this, in this setting? Anyone? Yeah, there's, a, there's a, 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 I'm in here. Where's my other mic on that side? Yeah, there's, there's one. Left, left, and right, right are both candidates. Good, so, so our obvious candidates here are left, left, and right, right. These are the two candidates. All right, or more formally, left is a candidate and right is a candidate. But you're right to say that left, left, and right, right are both Nash equilibria in this game. Is that right? And what's more, not only are they Nash equilibria, but what kind of Nash equilibria are they? They're strict Nash equilibria. In fact, they're strict. Both are strict. So indeed, left is evolutionarily stable and right is evolutionarily stable. All right, let's just talk through the intuition for that and make it kind of clear. So suppose you're in a society in which everybody drives on the left. So this is England. And suppose a mutation occurs, and the mutation you could think of as an American tourist. All right, an American tourist is dropped into English society, hasn't read the guidebook carefully, starts driving on the right, and what happens to the tourist? They die out pretty rapidly, right? Right? And conversely, if you drop an unobservant Brit into America and they drive on the right, they're going to get squashed pretty quickly. Right? So it's kind of clear, clear why everyone driving on the left or why everyone driving on the right is uh, each of these are perfectly good, uh, uh, evolutionarily stable social conventions. All right, but despite that, despite that simplicity, there's kind of a useful lesson here. So the first lesson here is you can have multiple evolutionarily stable settings. You could have multiple social conventions that are evolutionarily stable. We shouldn't be surprised particularly if we think there's some evolutionary type force, some, some sort of random uh, dynamic going on that's ge generating uh, social conventions that are then stable. We should not be surprised to see different social conventions in different parts of the world. And in fact, we do. We do see parts of the world like England and Japan and Australia where they drive on the left, and we see parts of the world like France and America where they drive on the right. All right, so we can have, we can have multiple evolutionary stable conventions. All right. And there's another lesson here which is you could imagine a society settling down to a social convention uh, down here. You could imagine ending up at a social convention of right-right. What do we know about the, so the social convention of everyone driving on the right? We know it's worse. We know it's worse than the social convention of everyone driving on the left. All right? At least in, at least in, my, in my version. All right? So what do we, what do we uh, regard it? What, what we see here, we can see that they're not necessarily efficient. These need not be equally good. All right, so it's, it's uh, hard to resist saying that American society's driving habits, uh, if we think about the alternatives to evolution, are a good example of unintelligent design. All right, all right, all right. So when you're talking about this in a more... Uh, um, a less formal way in your anthropology or political science or sociology classes, you want to have in the back of your mind what we mean by evolutionary stability and that it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to arrive at efficiency. Right? And in some sense, this is exactly analogous to what we discussed uh, when we looked at games like this with rational players playing, uh, if you think about coordination games. These are essentially coordination games. All right, that was a fairly straightforward example. Uh, to leave it up there, let me... There's another board here somewhere. Here we go. 
Let's look at yet another example, slightly more interesting. So today I'm going to spend most of today just looking at examples and talking about them. All right, so here's an, another example of a game we might imagine. And once again, it's a two-by-two two game, nice and simple game. All right, and here the payoffs are as follows. So down the diagonal, we have 0, 0, 0, 0, and off the diagonal, we have 2, 1, and 1, 2. So what is this game, essentially? It's very, very similar to a game we've seen already in class. Anybody? This, this is essentially Battle of the Sexes. Right? I've taken the Battle of the Sexes game, the dating game, I've just twiddled it around to make it symmetric. All right? So this is a symmetric version of Battle of the Sexes. Or our dating game. All right? And you could think of this game also in the context of driving around. All right? So you could imagine that uh, uh, one version of this game, uh, you sometimes uh, hear this game referred to as chicken. All right? What's the game chicken when cars are involved? Anybody? What's the game chicken when cars are involved? Now, it's probably a good thing if people don't know this. No one knows this? Okay. Uh, somebody knows it. Can I, get the, can I get the mic way back there? Shout out. Right, right. So you could imagine, here we are on a road that perhaps isn't big enough to have driving on the left and driving on the right. These two cars face each other. They drive towards each other, both of them going in the middle of the road. Right? And the loser is the person who swerves first. So you, could think of, you could think of A as being the aggressive strategy of not swerving, and B as being the less aggressive, the more benevolent strategy, if you like, of swerving. So the best thing for you is for you to be aggressive and the other person to swerve, and then at least they remain alive. All right? And conversely, uh, if, if you're benevolent and they swerve, you, you remain alive, but they win. And unfortunately now, if you're both aggressive, you get nothing. And the way we've written this game, if you're both benevolent, you get nothing. All right? you, could imagine, you could imagine making uh, some more negatives here. All right? So this is a game that seems kind of important in nature, not just in uh, teenage male behavior but in, uh, in animal behavior, since we're starting to talk about uh, 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 aggression, aggression and non-aggression. All right. OK, so what's evolutionarily stable in this game? Well, remember, our starting point is what? Our starting point is to look for symmetric Nash equilibria. OK, so are there any symmetric Nash equilibria in this game? And if so, what are they? Anybody? Well, there are some Nash equilibria in, in pure strategies. There are some Nash equilibria in this game. For example, AB is a Nash equilibrium, and BA is a Nash equilibrium. But unfortunately, they're not symmetric. Right? They're not symmetric. And so far, we're focusing on games that, is, that are symmetric. Right? There's just random matching. There's no asymmetry in the, in the roles of the row and column player. Although in the, hand, in the uh, handout, not the handout, the, in the reading packet I made for you, they do also look at some asymmetric uh, versions of games. But this, uh, for now, we're just looking at symmetry. So neither AB nor BA will serve our purpose because they're not symmetric Nash equilibria. In fact, in fact, there is no symmetric, there's no symmetric pure strategy Nash equilibrium in this game. All right? So it can't be, it can't be that if this was, if this was a species, if this was, a, if this was an animal that, that uh, came in, uh, that, uh, that had two possible strategies, aggression or, less, or, or passivity, all right, can't be the case in this particular game that you end up with 100% aggression out there, 100% gene, aggressive genes out there, or 100% uh, unaggressive genes out there. Either case, uh, if, if, if you had 100% aggressive genes out there, then uh, th it would be doing very, very badly, and you get, a, you get an invasion of passive genes. And if you had 100% passive genes out there, you get an invasion of aggressive genes. Right? You can't have a pure, uh, a pure ESS, a pure, a pure evolutionary stable uh, uh, 
uh, gene mix out there. All right. So what does that suggest? It suggests we should start looking at mixed strategies. All right. There is a mixed strategy. Yeah, there is a mixed, no, let's have the word symmetric first. There is a symmetric mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium in the game. All right, and we could go through and work it out. We all know now, probably you've been uh, laboring through the homework assignments, so you all know how to find a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium in this game. You have to set the mix to make the other player indifferent between uh, her two strategies. But this is a game we've seen already. It's essentially battle of the sexes. All right, so we probably remember from a week ago what that, uh, what, what that equilibrium mix is. Can anyone remember what the equilibrium mix is in battle of the sexes? It's two-thirds, one-third. Turns out that two-thirds, one-third, two-thirds, one-third is a Nash equilibrium here. So if you go back to your notes a week ago, you'll find something very much like that was, an, was a Nash equilibrium in the, in the original version of Battle of the Sexes. It was, it, it, the, a week ago, it would have been two-thirds, one-third, one-third, two-thirds, because things weren't symmetric. Now I've made things symmetric. It's just two-thirds, one-third for both players. You can check it at home. All right. So what's this telling us? It's telling us that there's at least an equilibrium in this game in which two-thirds of uh, the genes are aggressive and one-third of the genes are unaggressive. All right. But does that mean anything? What could that mean? In terms of biology, what could that mean? Well, so far, we've been looking at evolutionary stable pure strategies. All right. And evolutionary stable pure strategies correspond to evolutionary stable situations in nature, which are what are called monomorphic. All right. Monomorphic. And monomorphic, monomorphic means one shape or one, one uh, you only get one type out there. But you can also have situations in nature where there are actually stable mixed types, all right? And they're called polymorphic. Polymorphic. It's probably not hyphenated. It's probably just one word. So you can have a monomorphic population. That's what we've focused on so far. But you could also have a mixed population. Now, for this to be a mixed population, we better change the definition accordingly. All right, we'll come back and talk about what it means in a second a bit more. But first, we better make sure we have an OK definition for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this definition down and do something you're not meant to do it usually in teaching. I'm going to use uh, the eraser to correct my definition. All right, so here I have my pure strategy definition. And let me just change it into a, strategy, into a definition that will allow for these polymorphic populations. So I'm going to change this into a p hat. I'm going to change this pure into mixed. And everywhere you see an s hat, I'm going to put a p hat. And to the here too. And everywhere you see an s prime, I'm going to put a p prime. And the reason I'm doing this this way is I want to emphasize that there's nothing new here. I'm just writing down the same definition as we had before, except I'm now allowing for the idea, allowing for the idea of populations being mixed. And I'm also, just note in passing, I'm also allowing for the possibility that a mutation might be mixed. A mutation might be mixed. Did I catch them all? All right, so I've just gone through the definition you have. Uh, and I've switched everything from pure to mixed. Let's put it up there again. OK. So in our example, in our example, does the mix two-thirds, one-third, does the mix two-thirds, one-third satisfy the definition above? Let's go through carefully. All right. So two-thirds, one-third is a Nash equilibrium. So we've satisfied part A. It's a symmetric Nash equilibrium. So we're OK there. Is, is this equilibrium a strict equilibrium? 
is this mixed population, two-thirds aggressive and one-third unaggressive, or this mixed strategy, is it a strict equilibrium? Well, how, 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 do, how do deviations do against it? Anybody? Equally well. Yeah, go ahead. Equally well. Equally well, equally well, thank you. So, right, so it can't be, it can't be a strict Nash equilibrium because if we deviated to A, we'd do as well as we were doing in the mix. Or if we deviated to B, we'd do as, as well as we're doing in the mix. What I'm saying it is, an A mutation does exactly as well against this mix as the mix does against itself, and a B mutation does exactly as well. In fact, that's how we constructed the equilibrium in the first place, right? We chose a P that made you indifferent between A and B, all right? So in a mixed Nash equilibrium, it can't be strict. Cannot be strict since it is mixed. In a mixed equilibrium, in a mixed Nash equilibrium, a genuinely mixed Nash equilibrium, by definition, you're indifferent between the strategies in the mix. All right? So to show that this is in fact evolutionary stable, we'd have to show rule B. So we'd need to show, we need to check. Give ourselves some room here. We need to check how the payoff of this strategy, let's call it P hat, how P hat does against all possible deviations and compare that with how those deviations do against themselves. We have to make this comparison. How does, how does this mix do against all other possible mixes versus how those mixes do against themselves? And we'd have to do this, unfortunately, we'd have to check this for all possible, and now we have to be careful, all possible mixed mutations P prime. All right, so that would take us a while. All right, it's, 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 it's actually possible to do. It's gonna, if you do some uh, enough math, it isn't so hard to do. So rather than prove that to you, uh, let me give you a heuristic argument why this is the case. All right, I'm going to try and convince you without actually proving it that this is indeed the case. All right, so here we are uh, with this population. Exactly two-thirds of the population is aggressive and one-third of the population is passive. All right, and suppose there is a mutation, P prime, that is more aggressive than P hat. So it's a relatively aggressive mutation. For example, this, uh, this mutation may be 100% aggressive, or at least it may be very, very highly aggressive. It may be 90% aggressive or something. Right? Now, I want to argue that that aggressive mutation is going to die out. And I'm going to argue it by thinking about this rule. So I want to argue that the reason this very aggressive mutation dies out is because the aggressive mutation does very badly against itself. Is that right? If, I'm a, if you have a very aggressive mutant, the very aggressive mutants do very, very badly against themselves. They get zero. All right? And that's going to cause them to die out. All right? What about the other extreme? What about a, a deviation that's very passive? So a very nice mutation of very passive types. For example, it could be 100% B or 99% you know, B or 98% B. All right? How will that do? Right? Well, it turns out in this game, again, it doesn't do very well against itself. Right? And in addition, in addition, the original mix, the mixed P hat, that is more aggressive than this very passive mutation, does very well against the mutation. Right? So the mix that's in there, the mix in, in the population already, is relatively aggressive compared to this very passive mutation. And so that, the, the incumbents, the relatively aggressive incumbents, do, are doing very, very well on average against the mutation, and hence, once again, this equality holds. All right, so just heuristically, without proving it, more aggressive mutations are going to lose out here because they do very badly against themselves, and more passive mutations are going to do badly because they make life easy for P hat, which is more aggressive than them. All right? All right, so it wasn't a proof, it's a heuristic argument, and it turns out indeed to be the case. All right? So in this particular game, a game you could imagine in nature, all right, a game involving aggression and passivity um, uh, within this species, it turns out 
that in this example, the only equilibrium is a mixed equilibrium with two-thirds aggressive and one-third unaggressive. And this raises the question, what does it mean? What does it mean to have a mix in nature? All right. So it could mean two different things. It could mean that the gene itself is randomizing. It could mean that the strategy played by the particular ant, squirrel, lion, or spider is actually to randomize. Right? That's possible. But there's another thing it could mean that's probably a little bit more important. What's the other thing it could mean? It could mean that in the stable uh, mix, the evolutionarily stable population for this particular spider, say, it could be that there are actually two types surviving stably in these proportions. If you go back to what we said about mixed strategies a week ago, we said one of the possible interpretations of mixed strategies is not that people are necessarily randomizing, but that you see a mix of different strategies in society. Right? And again, in nature, one of the impossible interpretations here, the polymorphic population interpretation, is that rather than just have all of this species look and act alike, it could be there's a stable mix of be behaviors and or appearances uh, in, this, uh, um, in this species. All right. So let me try and convince you that that's not an uninteresting idea. All right. So again, with apologies, I'm not a biologist. I spent a bit of time on the web this weekend trying to come up with uh, good examples for you. And the example I really wanted to come up with, I couldn't find on the web, uh, which makes me think maybe it's apocryphal. But I'll tell you the story anyway. All right? It's not entirely apocryphal. It may just be that my version of it's apocryphal. All right? So this particular uh, example I have in mind is to do with elephant seals. All right? And I think even if it isn't true of elephant seals, it's definitely true of certain types of fish. So the elephant seals make a better story. All right, so, okay, so imagine that, the, that these elephant seals, it, it's, uh, uh, it turns out that there are two possible mating strategies for male elephant seals. By the way, do you all know what elephant seals are? Yeah, they're these big, you know, people looking blankly at me. You have some rough image in your mind of an elephant seal. You've all seen enough nature shows, right? Yeah? Yes? No? Yes? Okay, so there are two male mating strategies for the, ele for the male elephant seal. One successful male mating strategy is to be uh, the head, the dominant, uh, or a dominant uh, elephant male, uh, uh, male elephant seal, and have, a, as it were, a harem of many female uh, uh, um, elephant seals with which the male mates with. All right? For the males in the room, don't get too happy. These are elephant seals, right? They're not you guys, right? All right, all right, so, all right so, so one possible successful strategy is to be a successful bull elephant seal and have many, 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 uh, uh, essentially, wives, right? So to be poly polygamous, all right? And uh, presumably to do that well, uh, a good, uh, you know, a thing that would go, go well with that strategy is to be huge, right? So you could imagine the successful elephant, ma uh, 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 male elephant seal being an enormous animal, looks like a sort of uh, uh, a linebacker in football, right? And basically fights off all other uh, big uh, elephant seals that, sh that show up. Right? But it turns out, I think I'm right in saying, if I did my research correctly, this is true among uh, northern elephant seals, but not true among southern elephant seals. We're talking about the Arctic, not the an Antarctic. But someone's going to correct me. Once it's on the web, I'm going to get floods of emails saying I've got this wrong. Well, never mind. OK, so it turns out that this is not quite evolutionarily stable. All right? Why is this not evolutionarily stable? So what's, the, what's, this, what's the alternative male strategy that can successfully invade the large bull harem keeper uh, elephant seal. Any guesses? Anyone, anyone looking for a successful career as an elephant seal, as a male elephant seal? <laughs> hmm? Say again? Good, good. So, good. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did people catch that? So, so, a good alternative strategy is to be an, a male elephant seal who looks remarkably like a female elephant seal. All right? So it's looking like, a, like a, a linebacker. They look like a wide receiver. All right? All right? All right? I, I, I'm probably offending somebody in the football team. Right? But you, you, you get the idea, right? And what do they do? They, they sneak in among these large numbers of male elephant seals, and they just mate with a few of them. All right? 
Right? So they look like a female elephant seal, so they, can, they can hide among the female elephant seals in the harem, and they mate with a few of them. And, and provided, provided this is successful enough, it'll be evolutionarily stable for the female elephant seal to want to mate with, it, with, with that too. All right? Right? Now, I forget if actually uh, this is exactly right, but it's certainly, uh, I did enough research over the, over the weekend to know it's right, at least in some species. And the nicest part of this story is that at least some biologists have a nice technical name for this, for this, uh, this strategy that was well described by our friend at the back. Uh, and the, the name for this strategy is um, SLF. And uh, since we're on film, I'm going to tell you what the S and the L are, but you're have to, you'll have to guess the rest. So this is, uh, this is sneaky. <laughs> this is uh, little. <laughs> and you can guess what that is. All right? All right? All right. So this turns, out, this turns out to be actually quite a common occurrence. It's been observed in a number of different species, perhaps not with the full uh, uh, added color I just gave to it. All right? OK. So having convinced you that, that polymorphic populations can be interesting, let's go back to a case, a more, a more subtle case of aggression and non-aggression, because that seems to be one of the most important things we can think of uh, in animal behavior. OK? So let's go back and look at a, a harder example of this, of where we, uh, where we started. So as, as these examples get harder, they also get more interesting. So that's why I want to get a little bit harder. So the, the chicken game, the battle of the sexes game, is not a particularly interesting uh, version of aggression and non-aggression. Let's look at a more general version of aggression versus non-aggression. And let's look, look at a game that's been studied a lot by biologists and a little bit by economists called hawk dove. Right? And again, just to stress, we're talking about, uh, uh, we're only talking about within species, pop, uh, within species competition here. So I don't mean hawks versus doves. I mean uh, thinking of hawk as being an aggressive strategy and dove as being a, 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 a dovish, a, a passive strategy. All right? So here's the game. And now we're going to look at more general payoffs than we did before. All right? So this is the hawk strategy. This is the dove strategy. Hawk and dove, and the payoffs are as follows, v plus c, sorry, start again, v minus c over 2, and v minus c over 2, and here we get v over 2 and v over 2, and here we get v and 0, and here we get 0 and v. All right, so this is a generalization, a more interesting version of the game we saw already. Let's just talk about it a little bit. So the idea here is there's some potential battle that can occur among these two animals. And the prize in the battle, the prize is V. All right, so V goes to, is the victor's spoils. And we're going to assume that V is positive. Right? And unfortunately, if the animals fight, so if the hawk meets another hawk, and they fight one, another, fight one another, then there are costs of fighting. So the costs of fighting are C, and again, we'll assume that they're positive. Right? So this is the cost of fighting. All right? And this more general format is going to allow us to do two things. We're going to look and ask what is going to be evolutionarily stable, all right, including mixtures now, and we're also going to be uh, allowed to ask, able to ask, what happens, what will happen to the evolutionary stable mix as we change the prize or as we change the cost of fighting? All right, seems a more interesting, uh, um, a richer game. Okay, so let's start off by asking could we have an evolutionary stable population of doves? All right, so is, is D an evolutionary stable strategy. I'll start using the term ESS now. So ESS means an evolutionary stable strategy. Is D an e ESS? All right, so in this game, could it be the case that we end up with a population of doves? Seems a nice thing to imagine, all right? But is it gonna occur in this game in nature? What do people think? How, how do we go about checking that? 
How do we go about checking that? What's the first step? First step is to ask, is dov dov a Nash equilibrium? Right? If it's evolutionary stable, in particular, dov dov would have to be a Nash equilibrium. Right? That's going to make it pretty easy to check. So is dov dov a Nash equilibrium in this game? It's not. It's not, right? But why not? Because if, if, if you had a mutation, I keep on tempted to say deviation, but I don't think of it as a mutation. If I had a mutation of hawks, all right, the hawk mutation uh, uh, against the doves is getting V, uh, whereas dove against dove is only getting V over 2. All right? So it's not Nash. All right, so we can't have a evolutionary stable population of doves, and the reason is there'll be a, a, a hawk mutation, an aggressive type will get in there and grow, much like we had last week when we, when we dropped Rahul into the classroom uh, in, in Prisoner's Dilemma, and he grew, all right, or his type grew. Okay, so second question is, is hawk an evolutionary stable strategy? Is Hawk an evolutionary stable strategy? So how do we check this? Well, we have to look at once again and ask the question. This is the first question to ask is, uh, is, is HH a Nash equilibrium? All right. So is it a Nash equilibrium? Well, I claim it depends. I claim it's a Nash equilibrium provided V minus C over 2 is at least as large as zero. Is that right? Is that right? It's a Nash equilibrium. It's a symmetric Nash equilibrium, provided hawk against hawk does better, or does at least as well as dove against hawk. So the answer is yes, if V minus C over 2 is at least as big as zero. All right. So now we have to think fairly carefully because there's two cases. So case one is the easy case, which is when V is strictly bigger than C. If V is strictly bigger than C, then V minus C over 2 is strictly positive. Is that right? In which case, what kind of a Nash equilibrium is this? It's strict, right? So if, if V is bigger than C, then Hawk, hawk is a strict Nash equilibrium. It's a strict Nash equilibrium. All right? The second case is if V is equal to C. If V is equal to C, then V minus C over 2 is actually equal to 0, which is the same as saying that the payoff of hawk against hawk is equal to the payoff of dove against hawk. Is that correct? All right. So in that case, what do we have to check? Oh, I've deleted it now. You have to come from your notes. What do I have to check in the case in which there's a tie like that? What do I have to check? I have to check. Right, in this case, I need to check. I need to check how hawk does against dove, because dove will be the, the uh, mutation. I need to compare that with the payoff of dove against dove. All right. OK. So how does hawk do against dove? What's the payoff of hawk against dove? Anybody? Payoff of hawk against dove? It shouldn't be that hard. It's on the board. Hawk against dove. Shout it out. V, v thank you. So this is V. And the, how, about, how about the payoff of dove against dove? V over 2. So which is bigger, V or V over 2? V is bigger because it's positive, right? So, it's, okay, so, it's, so this is bigger, so we're OK. So what have we shown? We've shown, we've shown, let's just draw it over here. We've shown that if V is at least as big as C, then H is an evolutionary stable strategy. All right. 
So in this game, in this uh, setting in nature, if the size of the prize to winning the fight is bigger than the cost that would occur if there is a fight, then it can occur that all the animals in this species are going to fight in an evolutionary stable setting. Let me say it again. If it turns out in this setting in nature that the prize to winning the fight is bigger, or at least as big as, the cost of fighting, then it, can t then it will turn out that it will be evolutionary stable for all the animals to fight. The only, the only surviving genes will be the aggressive genes. All right? And what does that mean? So what typically do we think of as the payoff to fights and the cost of fighting? Just put this in a, in a biological context. The, the fight could be about what? It could be, let's go back to where we started from, it could be males fighting for the right to mate with females. That's going to be pretty important for genetic fitness. It could be fem females fighting over the right to mate with, with males. It could also be fighting over, uh, for example, food or shelter. Right? So if the, if, the, if the prize is large and the cost of fighting is small, you're going to see fights in nature. All right? But we're not done yet. Why are we not done? Because we've only considered the case when v is bigger than c. So we also need to consider the case when c is bigger than v. This is the case where the cost of fighting are high relative to the prize in the particular setting we're looking at. So again, let's go back to the example. Suppose the cost of fighting could be that the animal could lose a leg or even its life, and the prize is just today's meal. Right, there are perhaps other meals out there. Then we expect something different to occur. However, we've already concluded that even in this setting, it cannot be the case to only to have doves in the population. Right? We've shown that even in the case where the cost of fighting are high relative to the prizes, it cannot be evolutionarily stable only to have dove genes around, passive genes around. So in this case, it must be the case that if anything is evolutionarily stable, it's going to be what? It's going to be a mix. It's going to be a mix. So in this case, right, we know that H is not ESS, and we know that D is not ESS. So what about a mix? What about some mix P hat? All right? And we could actually put the P hat in here. We can imagine looking for a mix, p hat 1 minus p hat that will be stable. Now, how do we go about finding a possible mixed population that has some chance, has some hope of being evolutionarily stable? So here we are, we're biologists, we're about to set up an experiment, we're about to either experiment, we're about to go out and do some field work out there. And we want to set things up, and we're asking the question, what's the, what's the mix we, we expect to see? What's the first exercise we should do here? What if it has any hope to be evolutionarily stable, what does it have to be? It has to be a symmetric Nash equilibrium. So the first step is, step one, find a symmetric mixed Nash equilibrium in which people will be playing p hat 1 minus p hat. The symmetric, so both, both sides will be playing it. OK. So this is good review for the exam on Wednesday. How do I go about finding a mixed equilibrium here? Shouldn't be too many blank faces since we, this is likely to come up on the exam on Wednesday. Uh, let's get some cold calling going on here. How do I find a mixed strategy? Let's find anybody. How, how do we find it? Yeah. How do I find a mixed strategy equilibrium? Uh, just use the other player's payoff. I use the other player's payoffs, and what do I do with the other person's payoffs? You, you're, oh, I you set them equal? Set them equal, OK. OK, so here it's a symmetric game. It's really there's, you know, there's only one population out there. So what I need, I need that the payoff of hawk against p hat, or p hat 1 minus p, I need this to be equal to the payoff of dove against this P. 
All right. So the payoff of hook is going to be what? Just reading up from up there. Let's use our pointer. So hawk p hat of the time will meet another hawk and get this payoff. All right, so they'll get so p of the time, they'll get a payoff of v minus c over 2. And 1 minus p hat of the time, they'll meet a dove and get a payoff of v. And dove against this same mix, p hat 1 minus p, p hat at the time they'll meet a hawk and get nothing. And 1 minus p hat at the time they'll meet another dove and get v over 2. Okay, everyone happy with the way I did that? That should be pretty familiar territory to everybody by now. Is that right? Okay, so I'm going to set these two things equal to each other since they must be equal if this is in fact a mixed strategy equilibrium. All right, and then I'm going to play around with the algebra, but so as to save time, I did it at home. So trust me on this. Trust me, all right, this is implication with the word trust on top of it, right? Right? Trust me that I got the algebra right, or check, check me at home. This is going to turn out to imply that p hat equals v on c. Right? p hat equals v on c. All right? So it turns out that there is, in fact, a, na a mixed Nash equilibrium. There's a mixed Nash equilibrium, which is of the following form v on c and 1 minus v on c played by both pairs. Okay? V, uh, v on c, 1 minus v on c played by both pairs. All right. Is this a strict Nash equilibrium? I found the Nash equilibrium. Is it strict? Everyone should be shouting it out. Is it strict? It can't be strict because it's mixed, right? By definition, it's not. it can't be strict because we know that deviating to H, or for that matter, deviating to D, yields the same payoff. So it can't be a strict Nash equilibrium. So we need to check something. So we need to check. It's not strict. Not strict. So we need to check. We need to check whether U of P hat against p prime is bigger than u of p prime against itself. And we need to check this for all possible mutations p prime. And again, that would take a little bit of time to do in class, so, to, so just trust me on it. And that, once again, let me give you the heuristic argument I gave to you before. It's essentially the same argument. Right? So the heuristic argument I gave you before was imagine a P prime, a mutation that is more aggressive than our candidate equilibrium. Right? If it's more aggressive, then it's going to do very, very badly against itself. Right? Because v, C is bigger than V in this case, it's actually going to get negative payoffs against itself. Right? Since it gets negative payoffs against itself, it turns out that will cause it to die out. Conversely, imagine a mutation that's relatively soft, that's relatively dovish. This mutation is very good for the incumbents because the incumbents uh, essentially beat up on it or, or score very highly on it. Right? So once again, the more dovish mutation will die out. All right? So again, that, that isn't a proof, but it, uh, trust the argument. Just, you know, we, need, we need to show this, but it does in fact turn out to be the case. All right, so what have we shown here? I didn't prove the last bit, but what we've, what we've argued is that in the case in which the costs of fighting in nature are bigger than the prizes of winning the fight, it is not the case that we end up with 100% doves. Right? So we don't end up with no fights, for example. No fights is not what we would expect to observe in nature. And we don't end up with 100% fights. 100% fights is not what we'd expect to see in nature. What we end up with is a mixture of hawks and doves such that V over C is the proportion of hawks. Right? So the fights that occur 
are essentially v over c squared. All right. We can actually observe those fights in nature. Okay, what lessons can we draw from this, sort of biology lessons? Right, so we, we used a lot of what we learned in the last day or so to figure out what the ESS was there. We kind of did the nerdy part. Now let's try and draw some lessons from this. All right. So the first thing we know is I, I, I've... Uh, Keeping what, what we cared about here, so we know we know that the that if v is smaller than c, then the then the evolutionary stable mixed population has v on c hawks. All right. So let's just see how much of this makes sense. So as v goes up. As the prizes go up, if you, if you took the same species and put them into a setting in which the prizes tended to be larger, all right, what, would we, what would we expect to see? Do we expect to see the proportion of hawks go up or down? Up, right? As V goes up, we see more hawks. All right, what else do we see? Not so surprisingly, as C goes up, if we look at settings where the cost of fighting is higher, right, settings where the cost of uh, fighting is higher, we tend to see more, more doves. All right. All right. And this is in e this is in so more hawks in the evolutionary stable mix, and more doves in the evolutionary stable mix. Now it's possible, of course, that the species in question can recognize these two different situations and be coded differently, to behave differently in these two different situations, but that's beyond the class for now. All right? Perhaps a more interesting observation is about the payoffs. Let's look at the actual genetic fitness of this species overall. So in this mix, what is the payoff? Well, how are we going to figure out what is the payoff? So the payoff in this mix, we can actually cons construct by looking at the payoff to dove. It doesn't really matter whether you look at the payoff to dove or the payoff to hawk. So let's look at the payoff to dove. All right, so the payoff, the payoff was what? It was, if you were a dove, then 1 minus v on c of the time, you met another dove. And in that instance, you got a payoff of v on 2. And it must be the payoff to being a dove is the same since they're mixing. All right, this is the payoff. All right. So what's happening to this payoff as we increase the cost of fighting? All right. What happens as C rises? So just to note out, what happens as C goes up? So you might think, naively, you might think that if you're in a setting, be it a social evolutionary setting or a, a biolo biology and nature uh, evolutionary setting, you might think that as the cost of fighting goes up for you guys in society or for the ants, antelopes, or lions we're talking about, you might think that the payoffs in society go down. Right? Cost of fighting go up, more, you know, more limbs get lost, and so on. Sounds like that's going to be bad for the, for the overall genetic fit fitness of the species. But in fact, we don't find that. What happens as C goes up? The payoff goes up, right? As C goes up, the payoff goes up. If we take C bigger, all right, this gets smaller, which means this is bigger. All right, everyone see that? Everyone see that? So just look at that term, 1 minus V over C times V over 2. It's actually increasing. It's increasing in C. So how does that work? As the cost of fighting go up, it's true that if you do fight, you're more likely to lose a finger or a limb or a claw or a, or a um, uh, thank you, whatever those things are called. 
right? All right uh, or a foot, whatever it is you're likely to, to lose. But the number of fights that actually occur in this evolutionary stable mix goes down, and it goes down sufficiently much to compensate you for that. Right? Kind of a remarkable thing. Right? So these animals that actually are going to lose a lot through fighting are actually going to do rather well overall because of that mix effect. Because that, if you like, it's one of those strategic effects again. All right? Now, of course, that raises a question, which is what would happen if a particular part of this species evolved that had lower cost of fighting, right? That could regrow a leg, right? It sounds like, it sounds like that would do pretty well, and that would be bad news for the species as a whole. All right? Third thing we can observe here is what's sometimes called identification. Identification. So what does identification mean here? It means that by observing the data in nature, by going out and filming these animals behaving for hours and hours, or changing their setting in a lab and seeing how they interact, or changing their setting in the field and seeing how they interact, we can actually observe something, namely the proportion of fights. Perhaps we can do better now and actually look at the genetics directly, since science has evolved. All right? And we can actually back out the V and the C. Right, by looking at the proportion of hawk genes out there, or hawkish behavior out there, we can actually identify what must be the ratio of V to C. We can, uh, we can uh, tell what the ratio V over C is from looking at data. Right, we started off with a little matrix I just written in Vs and Cs. I didn't put any numbers in there. We can't tell what V is, we can't tell what C is, but we can tell what the, rate, what the ratio is by looking at real world data. So if you spend enough hours in front of the TV watching nature shows, you could back this out, not literally. Right? You <coughs> need to actually do some serious work. All right? So this is a useful input of theory into empirical science. You want theory to be able to uh, set up the science so you can back out the unknowns in the theory. And that's called identification, not just in biology, but in economics as well. All right. Now, there's one other thing you'd like theory to be, other than identifiable. You'd like theory to be testable. Right? You'd like theory to make predictions that were kind of outside of the sample you started with. All right? Is what I'm saying familiar to everybody in the room? This is a very familiar idea, I'm hoping, to everybody. Slightly philo philo philosophy, but very familiar idea. If you have a new theory, it's one thing for that theory to explain the existing facts. Right? But you'd like it to predict new facts. Why? Because it's a little easy to, it might be a little bit too easy to reverse engineer a model or theory to fit existing facts. But if it has to deal with new facts, that's kind of exciting. Right? That's a real test. That makes sense? So you might ask about this theory. You might say, well, it's just a whole bunch of just so stories. Anyone know what I mean? We may have just so story. It's a just so uh, stories was children's stories written by Kipling. And people sometimes accuse a lot of evolutionary theory as being just so stories because you know what the fact is already and you reverse the game, you come up with a story afterwards. And they say, that, that doesn't sound like good science. So you'd like this theory, this theory that matches game theory with evolution, to predict something that we hadn't seen before, had not seen before, and then we can go out and look for it and see if it's there. And that's exactly what we now have. So our last example is a slightly more complicated game again. And the slightly more complicated game has three strategies. And the strategies are called, uh, well, I'll tell you what the strategies are called in a second, actually. I'll give you the payoffs, first of all. So once again, this is a game about different forms of aggression, uh, and we'll look at the, and we'll look at other interpretations in a second. And once again, V is going to be the prize for winning, zero is going to be the prize for losing, and one is if it's a tie. And just short sighted enough, so I can't read my own writing, so I hope I got this right. There we go. All right. So this is the game. And we're going to assume that the prize V is somewhere between 1 and 2. 
right? So V you can think of as, as winning, zero is losing, and one is if it's a tie. Does anyone recognize what this game essentially is? It's essentially rock, paper, scissors. Now it turns out that when biologists play rock, paper, scissors, they give it a different name. They call it scratch, bite, and trample. Scratch, bite, and trample is essentially the tactics of the Australian football team. <laughs> All right, so scratch, bite, and tra trample are the three strategies. And it's, it's a little bit like rock, paper, and scissors. How we change it? First, we added one to all the payoffs to make sure there's no negatives in there. And second, we added a little bit more than one to winning. Right? If we add one to everything, uh, sorry, a little bit less than one to winning. Right? So if we add, if we add one to everything, then V would have been two. But we've kept, we've kept V somewhere between, between one and two. All right? So this is certainly a game you could imagine in nature. There's three possible strategies for this, spe for this uh, species. And the payoff matrix happens to look like this. All right, so where's my prediction going to come from? Well, since this is rock, paper, scissors, we know that there's really only one hope for an evolutionary stable strategy. Right? Since, since it's essentially rock, paper, scissors, what would, if, if there is an evolutionary stable strategy or an evolutionary stable mix, what must it be? One third, one third, one third. Right? So the only hope, the only hope for an ESS is one third, one third, one third. All right, let's put that in here. So one third, one third, one third. And you can check at home that that indeed is a mixed strategy equilibrium. All right? And the question is, is this evolutionarily stable? Is this evolutionarily stable? All right? So we know it's a Nash equilibrium, that I've given you, and we know it's not a strict Nash equilibrium. Everyone OK with that? It can't be a strict Nash equilibrium because it's mixed. All right? So if this is an ESS, it must be the case we'd have to check that, let's call this P hat again, like we've been doing. Right? We'd have to check that the payoff from P hat against any other P prime would have to be bigger than the payoff from P prime against itself. Right? We need that to be the case. All right, so let P prime be scratch. Let P prime be scratch. All right, so let's compare these things. So U of P hat against scratch is what? Well, you're playing against scratch. You are a third scratch, a third bite, a third trample. So a third of the time you get one, a third of the time you get nothing, and a third of the time you get V. Is that right? So your payoff is one plus V over three. All right? How do we do if we're scratch against scratch? The payoff of scratch against scratch is what? No prizes for this. What's the payoff of scratch against scratch? One. Which is bigger? One plus V on three or one? Well, look, V is less than two, right? V is less than two, so one plus V on three is less than one, so one is bigger. So in this game, the only hope for an evolutionary stable mix was a third, a third, a third, and it isn't stable. So here's an example, example, in this example, there is no evolutionary stable strategy. There's no evolutionary stable mix. And then the obvious question is, what does that mean in nature? Can we find a setting that looks like rock, paper, scissors in nature in which nothing is evolutionary stable? If nothing is evolutionary stable, what's going to happen? We're going to see kind of cycling around. You're going to see a lot of the scratch strategy followed by a lot of the uh, uh, trample strategy, followed by a lot of the bite strategy, and so on. All right? So it turns out that's exactly what you see when you look at these, uh, um, the example I've left you on the web, there was an article in Nature in the mid-90s that looked at a certain type of lizard. And these lizards come in three colors. I forget what the colors are. No, I wrote it down. One is orange, one is yellow, and one is blue. 
And these lizards have three strategies. One, uh, uh, the orange lizard, is like our big elephant bull. It likes to keep a harem of many, or a large territory with many female lizards in it to mate with. But that can be invaded by our SLF strategy, which turns out to be the yellow lizard. The yellow lizard can invade and just mate with a few of these female lizards. Right? But when there are too many of these sneaky yellow lizards, then it turns out that they can be invaded by a blue lizard, and the blue lizard has much smaller territories. It's almost monogamous. All right? So what happens in nature is you get a cycle, orange invaded by yellow, invaded by blue, harem keeper invaded by sneaky, invaded by monogamous, invaded by harem keeper again. And indeed, the population does cycle around exactly as predicted by the model. So here's an example of evolutionary theory via game theory making a prediction that we can actually go off and test and find. This, for biologists, is like finding a black hole. It's a really cool thing. All right, we'll leave evolution here. Midterm on Wednesday. We'll come back to do something totally different next week. See you on Wednesday.